I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. So, Brandon, I yes. want you, I want you to share your public shame. My I wanna, public I shame. I want to public. I want to publicly shame you for what you have done. Is it related to this? Is it this? It is explicitly related to that stack of cards you have. <laughs> so, Brandon. Brandon, do you want to tell me what you did? These, I want to preface this with saying that I didn't know this was a thing because it wasn't a thing when I was, like, active in in in, in, in Magic the Gathering. So I, I bought a booster box. I bought a booster yes, box. Yes, uh, you did not buy a booster box. Tell, tell them what you actually bought. So... I thought I bought a booster box because that's what the GameStop website advertised this clearance booster box uh, as, charging the same amount of money as all the other booster boxes. Um, no, 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 no. And then it I, said it was a collector's booster box. And, and then I get this booster box in the mail, and I go, "Huh? They they got really efficient in their packaging. This is awfully." small compared to what i thought it was a single it was a single booster i got yeah, it sure was single i got a single fucking booster and you got jank just foil jank <laughs> yeah all pretty much is. oh gosh yeah i didn't I, know I, that was I, a thing i didn't know you could buy yeah. a single booster for the price of a whole bunch of boosters well okay so you paid like 20 right it's twenty something, maybe yeah. thirty. So yeah, yeah. so I, I yeah. should have gotten like at least three if I was paying full price. This was on clearance. Uh, oh, did prices you're change? Working, uh, prices have changed. If you're working off of the model from when we were playing, thirty would have gotten you like seven packs. Yeah, I thought I was getting uh, like a, like a like a little grip. Yeah, no, no. Now, now, uh, a single so a single booster of, um. Uh, Command of Legends Baldur's Gate is about eight bucks for for set boosters, and uh, uh, Double Masters is fifteen dollars for a draft booster. That's, so that's crazy. I just want the although, experience of of cracking a fresh box. I haven't done that. That, that was since, also since the last unset is the last time I got a full box. So that was about. 2016, 2017, I want to say. Somewhere in there. Probably. That's the last time they were on Mass Drop, and I just bought a, a, you know, a, a box or two oh, of... Mass uh, Drop. On... Yeah. Uh, unstable Magic the Gathering. Let's see. I want to make sure I, I was right. Also, those you have your lands still, right? From yeah, unstable? I've got to go through everything. But lands, I... Because... Uh, whenever I offload cards, I always keep the lands, because you always need lands. You know, they're always so, valuable. The unstable lands are like three bucks a pop, and you should have about... You bought two boxes, like 64 of them, I think? Yeah, yeah. Roughly? Yeah. So, you know... Oh, 36. Sorry, 36. So you should have 74 of them. Um, oh, okay. And that's like, what? You know, $210? Something like that. That's worth... Actually, that's worth it. Just I'm on TCG Play right now, and uh, a box is 135 so that's, yeah so yeah is is an unstable box still worth 135 oh yeah. yeah it is huh they they maintained their they stayed whatever because um, they're fun right magic is magic is good on its own but it, it it there's rule nerds because they like read their cards and like care about rules or whatever but then yeah, the unseries <laughs> is super fun because it breaks all of that and you get to have but you fun. still but brandon but brandon you still need to read the cards yeah i mean sort of i mean as long as you know the word legumes you're fine um it, 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 that, that that yeah god damn it brandon <laughs> um so uh 
I actually want to cut the banter short this week. Okay. Because... Um, it's a biggin? It's a honker? So, okay. So, what happened was, I've been I've been doing some new work, right, on the side that I can't really talk about. Okay. For reasons. Uh, like, I can't tell... I can't, I can't talk about it publicly. I can talk about it to you. I've told you what I'm doing. Yeah. But I can't publicly talk about it. So, um... I didn't do the episode until Wednesday this week and into Friday and to Thursday because I forgot and I was like, <laughs> shit, what am I going to do? So yeah. um, I That's, kind of stumbled across this topic. You you need to get like one buffer episode. You just need to keep one copy on retainer. <laughs> See, Brandon, Brandon, it keeps me sharp. It keeps me sharp. Not having... Not having a safety net keeps me sharp. That's Thanks. that's like how I work. We are opposites. I, the, the level of anxiety, of anxiety I get of not having something. Let me go into my folder. Let me see it. Uh, you have a fuck ton. It, it's at least you like have a seven. lot. I have at least yes. like seven. <laughs> so just to and and the worst part is I research. I do research for a living. That's like <laughs> literally my job. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, no, I, I, keeping on the razor's edge, that just keeps me fresh. It keeps me going. <laughs> keeps you sharp. If I, it, it's the only thing, it's the only way I can feel. <laughs> it's, it's the only. <laughs> oh, um, like a nice Kamikoto so, knife. Sharp. Which is also, that's, that's a, that's a joke. If you're, if you're a knife nerd, that's a joke. Don't buy those. Okay. Let's <laughs> get like an actual nice get do your research. God damn it, Brandon. Um so I uh I stumbled across this, right? And I was like, "Oh. So w- what I'm talking about this week is the Bennington triangle." And I'm like, "Oh, a triangle? Cool. Those always geometry. have some weird fucking stories." Yeah. Yeah. So like there, there's always some strange stories and triangle things, right? Like, you know, yeah. usually there's some paranormal bullshit, yada, yada, yada. This story is a little different. Um, <laughs> it's a different kind of triangle. Where is... Where's Bennington? It, like, that's not... Vermont. That, that do- okay, because in my head, I went, yeah. that doesn't sound oceanic. No, it's it's Vermont. It's near... Um, If you go to, like, Troy, like yeah. Albany, Troy... And then just go east. You're pretty much in Bennington because okay. that's like Vermont. So gotcha. So it's like an hour, yeah. what an hour and a half or something. Uh, I think my I don't think it's an hour and a half. <laughs> There's well, I, I'm thinking Albany's like an hour. So if we're heading two hours, three hours, like we're it's it's you can go there and back in a day. It is it's let's see is how close it is. Let's see because I I also might have been on walking. Or bike riding, because it said nine hours for me, which <laughs> might be because I said cycling, because I was looking up a cycling path the other day. Okay, um, look at you getting your exercise. Trying, but it's also fucking hot. So, like. It's so hot. And the crazy thing is, like, I've started paying attention to, temp- like, temperature at different locations at different times of day, and just the. Cities are, are are about five degrees hotter. Or let me rephrase that, because Kingston is five degrees hotter than all of the surrounding area. Like, as soon as you get out of, like, wherever, Rondout or Woodstock or whatever, like, county you happen to be in, and then get to, like, the actual city part, that shit jumps, like, five degrees. It's crazy. No, no, it's fair. I mean, it's the blacktop. It is. It is. Like, they yeah. should probably... Um, start thinking about this has to be a thing. Let me. I, I have to, there has to be. I'll do, go down this nerd hole later. There White has top. to be someone who like re-engineered blacktop to not be a heat sink. I mean, that's that's basically uh, making making them like solar panels, right? Because <clears> like not even solar panels, energy. just so they don't like absorb so much damn radiation I mean, it's black but the problem is if you if you make it a color that like reflects you're gonna cause blind outs 
Well, it just has to be less reflective, right? It doesn't have to... We're not looking to make it cooler. We're just looking to make it less terrible. So if it's something that's, like... Even if it's the same color, but, like, absorbs the energy differently, or you change the mass of it so it doesn't hold on to the heat as long as it... it then you're good. Yeah, um, but, like, if you change the mass, then it's gonna... Okay, you know what? You know what, Brandon? Let's move on from this. <laughs> Let's move on from this. If there's any local civil engineering companies that want to take me on as a contractor, <laughs> I've got a lot of questions for you. We can make some changes. Maybe reduce my electricity questions. bill. Oh, I have so I many questions, questions about the chemical properties of fucking pavement. Um, so it's about two and a half hours away from us, so you're right. Um, <clears throat> okay. So... It's been a while since the last time we covered a high strangeness triangle. Um, if you'll remember, that was the Bridgewater Triangle. Yeah. Uh, all the way back in episode 40. Um, and if you haven't that heard long the three-parter. Ago. Yes. Yes. If you haven't heard the three-part two-parter, um, the Bridgewater Triangle was a very generously defined triangle in southeastern Massachusetts because it was, like, fucking crazy big and, like, random-ass things were in it. Yeah. Um, and it had a lot in it. Right, a lot of like weird stories. There were puckwudgies, aliens, and uh, ghostly hitchhikers. Which, if you're on, if you visit the Discord, uh, that ghostly one of those ghostly hitchhikers welcomes you when you enter the Discord. <laughs> that that is true. Wasn't the puckwudgie a uh, a request we had back in yeah forty ish yeah, back in the day? Ago? Yeah. Back in the day. Well, the puckwudgie the puckwudgie was part of the reason why I, I uh, that I think that and the Bridgewater Triangle were part of the same request, which is why I covered it the first time. Okay. Um, so this time, like I said, uh, we're going to Vermont to the Bennington Triangle. Now, before we get into it, for everyone who's there, who's listening, um, I am going to say that there is a trigger warning for this episode. There. Um, for for people from Vermont or from like people who a thing happened to. Uh, just in general, a thing happened to because okay. um, we're prom- predominantly focusing on a string of disappearances from 1945 to 1950. So it's gonna be a little more true crimey this episode, but I promise we will talk about paranormal shit. Okay. Um, and also of those disappearances, uh, there's one that's more or less confirmed to be a murder. Gotcha. Um, and there's also going to be discussions of uh self harm, depression, and um uh child abduction. Oh, no. <laughs> you're, you're just <laughs> In the episode database, we have all these checkboxes where if there's a red flag, so you just found and you just ran the gambit across all the red flags. I, uh, to be uh, fair, yeah. I, I wasn't looking for something like this. It just kind of happened. Yeah. Okay. Just like child um, abduction. You don't seek it out. It just happens. To be fair, most child abduction happens because of the family. Yeah. Yeah. And which that's a whole that's not this podcast that's someplace underneath that's not us <laughs> um so brandon people like to set boundaries in space right um that's, pe- that's ma- people's favorite thing that's it's literally people's like it's literally it's literally what i research yeah it's like that's- my whole thing is people putting imaginary boundaries on things yeah um, like even just like outside of even like borders and anything like that and even outside of like property lines it's like if you're on like a school bus and share an armrest like everyone's <laughs> setting just boundaries everywhere all the time <laughs> hiking trails baseball diamonds yeah. uh urinal you stalls know, gr- sacred spaces graveyards yeah just it's, the, setting imaginary boundaries, for boundaries. Where to bury people yeah, what do they care? Um, so, you can touch their no-no zone. What did you say? I don't. I I blacked out for a minute. Okay, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't quite catch that. Um, you can touch a no-no zone. They're dead. They don't care. Oh, you can touch my no-no that's... zone when I'm dead. I mean, that's it's fine. <laughs> I'm I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I I feel like I feel like it. It doesn't matter what you think. I feel like it's what you're your wife and daughter think they'll they'll be fine they watched weekend at bernie's yesterday 
Did they really? Yeah. Yeah, I was working Amazing. on... I, I was doing some uh, uh, construction on the house that they were watching. That's that great. That's I, fucking great. I, I, I literally like, now, walked in to get more water, and I was like, are you just watching Weekend at Bernie's 1? And now your daughter knows. It would have been weirder if they were watching Weekend at Bernie's 2. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't understand where this plot came from. She... Oh, I watch a lot of, like, kung fu movies and a lot of... um. Uh, sumo and mm -hmm. it's my my daughter has started um she started enacting or acting out in ways that she sees in the movies that she watches with me where she'll just be chilling and she'll go ah! and like huh, 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 like do these little like fake <laughs> for no reason <laughs> it's so funny she'll oh, do it and Erica bad. will be like you did this to her this is your fault that's gonna be the rest of her life too. Oh, it will be. It's just a fact. That's just a fact. Once once that starts, you never stop. Um, <laughs> so, anywho, the uh, the Bennington Triangle is centered more or less around the uh, Glastonbury Mountain in Vermont. Okay. Um, which uh, there's really no like real physical meaning to the triangle, right? And to be completely honest, Brandon. I have no idea how anyone picked out what the triangle's, like, boundaries were, right? Does it have defined um, boundaries, or is it just people just called it a triangle because they are aware of Bermuda? <laughs> and they're like, well, any 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 zone where weird things happen, regardless of its area, is all of a sudden a triangle. So we're going to talk about that, uh, because it was one person who coined it, and I have things to say about that person. <laughs> Does that person wear a hat frequently? I don't know, but okay. they uh, they wrote the Weird New England book. Okay, so... it's someone different than I, uh, who I was thinking of. Yeah, they, they, they definitely wrote the Weird New England book, which is, uh, yeah. Um, which also is why this, this sounded familiar to me when I first read it, because I had the Weird New England book like on my bookshelf for the longest time. Um, okay. Yeah. So, we begin our story... In 1945, Glastonbury, Vermont, right? Uh, originally, the town was chartered by New Hampshire, which is weird to me, uh, okay. in 1791 with a population of 34 individuals. So that's what we're dealing with. Okay, gotcha. Um, the mountain the town sat on is difficult terrain, and living on it is extremely rough, right? Uh, many of the people who were in the original town, like I think every family that was in the original town churned out and was replaced by new people because that's how hard it was li to live there um yeah. the population of the town would sit stagnant until after the civil war uh when it ballooned in 1880 to a whopping 241 people oh wow they're bustling there's metropolis. Some numbers they're, metropolis it's that's not too far away from the population size of the town i grew up in like, Cotta Kill, I yeah, think but, it's only, like, 600. Yeah, you say that, but, like, it's... The town you grew up in is, like, you drive through it on on uh, Lucas. It's adjacent and, like, to bigger places. It's adjacent to two other towns. Like, it's it's sandwiched. It's not, yeah. like... It's, the it's not, like, between there's... spot. It's the between spot between spots people actually want to be in. But like also also there's like homes right up against it on both sides. Like it's not like it's it's in the middle of nowhere. There I mean there there's it's, been a lot of livestock wandering through our property before. <laughs> but when my but parents you property. still there's there's still fucking houses like yeah, all the way houses. up and all the way down. It's not like it's it's yeah. not like it's just like in the middle of the woods. No, there's a road. I mean if someone's from the city, they might consider it the middle of the woods, but, you know. If someone's from the city, they'd be like, wow, <laughs> we're rough. This is the it. middle of nowhere. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm just like, this is nothing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as I said, mountain sat in the difficult terrain. Um, population, fairly stagnant. Uh, however, uh, the growth, when the town did grow to the 241 people, um, it was a direct result of business interests in nearby Bennington, okay. which had about 6,000 people at the same time, for reference. So, Okay. 
um, with a trolley, which was built in 1872 uh, to more readily access like the town. And I'm assuming some some timber was passed along that because like you're not going to make a railroad and not use it. Right. No, Um, it's it's going to be heavily used. So but Brandon, I want to say something about this trolley. It's fucking wild. Right. So uh, according to, to the Wikipedia for this, it would climb 250 feet in a mile at some points. Yeah. I did the math on that, Brandon. That's a 5% grade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, for reference, a modern freight chain runs at a grade of about 1.5%. Yeah, that that's steep enough where, like... At- when I read that, I was questioning about if it operated during the winter. Yeah. So <laughs> so I just want to, like, say that, like, to contextualize how fucking rough this terrain is, they made a trolley at a 5% grade. And usually, if you're putting a railroad down, you minimize the amount of grade that you can to, like, the best of your ability. And... That means that that was the minimization that they could do. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was so, the, the easiest they could have made it on that engine. Yes. That is that is how easy they could do it. So it, just, just imagine, if you will, how fucking mountainous this region is. Um, and because this area was like, it was more or less timber was what was being like gathered, right? Um I, I kind of assumed that this hauled some logs at some point, right? And like I said, it's one... Brandon, in my opinion, of all the things we're going to talk about, this is one of the most supernatural things about the region. The train? The train. Because it is it is it is above normal. For, it is. Like, the literal definition, it is not a normal train. This is not normally how steep trains go. <laughs> um, but by the late 1880s, uh, Glastonbury had harvested all of its mature trees. Um, all of its... Tr- okay. All so, of its so mature it was hauling trees. trees. It, it must have, right? Because, like, like, I can't imagine what else it was like. I, like, it definitely was carrying people. I saw trolley pictures, right? But, yeah. But, like... I can't imagine that they didn't like strap a bunch of logs to a few flatbeds. If you're going to clear an down. area to do and literally anything is, is you know the, the, you got to put the trees somewhere. So yeah. Cuz like also also it's 241 people, right? I don't know if a trolley it's worth making a trolley for 201 people. 241 people. No. It would make sense if it was a trolley that also if it was like a uh a railroad line that also had it happened to have a trolley on it. Uh-huh. But I, I couldn't find any, like, definite, like, proof that there was hauling of uh, wood on it. So, I don't know. Um, but after they lost all their mature trees, they more or less folded because um, uh, they didn't have ship to ship out. <laughs> they, uh, they shipped out the only thing they had and then yeah. had to leave. Yeah, pretty much. It's a ghost town now. And actually, in 1937, uh, the town was unincorporated. Do you want to know how many people it had in it when it unincorporated? There's, oh gosh, how many people? Seven. How? Okay. So when they were in a population Seven. of eight, how do you choose who the mayor is? <laughs> like, because then it's not a campaign. Oh, it's, it's whoever fucked the most people in the town. The most promiscu- promiscuous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's it's... that's what determines it. Unless they're a woman, because this is 1937. True. So they could they could be a woman and they couldn't be not white. So it's whatever Pretty white much. male gave out the best hand jobs was the mayor. Pretty much. Perfect. Pretty much. I mean, that's basically politics. Yeah. Still. <laughs> Everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So that brings us to our fir- that brings us to the story itself, though. Now that we've kind of set the scene, um, this is 1945, so it's about you know three eight years after the uh, after the town unincorporates, right? Okay. Um, I should also note this is the only one that actually the only person who actually disappears in the vicinity of Glastonbury. Um, everyone else disappears from other areas in the area, right? 
Okay. Uh, which is important to note because I'll, there's some people who say that it only happens around the town, which is fucking wrong. Um, so Mitty Rivers was a 74-year-old hunting guide. There, See, I suspect the 70-year-old in the woods part might be more... There's... I suspect... I feel that the, the disappearance is less mysterious than people might think. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he was guiding a group of four hunters through Hell's Hollow, according to Wikipedia, which I couldn't... Like, I'm not sure if that was correct, but that's a fucking wild name. Hell yeah. Um, which was about five miles south of the ghost town, right? Near Long Trail Road, which remember Long Trail, because that's going to come up multiple times in the story. Uh, the group had established a campsite in the hollow, and Mitty had gone off on his own for some reason. I'm assuming he was, like, going hunting or something, because, like, that's what hunters do. Foraging, um, scouting, what have you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was, He did express intention that he would be back to camp by lunch. Okay. 3.30 that day, he still hasn't returned. Now, of course, the party begins looking for him. Uh, so, Brandon, if it's a hunting party, yeah, how do you think they're going to look for him? Please just, just tell me the first thing that pops into your head. I presume they're going to head in the direction he kind of went, fan out a little bit, and go, Hey, Mitty, where are you? you know, we're looking for you. Call us, yell out if you're hurt. Some, something That's like that. That's half of it. That's half of it. Okay. Um, so not only did they call, call out to him, which is what you've said, uh, they shot firearms. Oh, perfect. <laughs> 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 like they just shot guns into the air to like let him know where they were. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is great, that's obviously. A, that's a choice. <laughs> it is absolutely a choice. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't find a trace of the man, resulting in a manhunt led by the local fire chief. Okay. So the search continued for some time, incorporating a plane, 95 federal troops from the army, Boy Scouts, and even a $4 a day reward for anyone who would participate in the search. And keep what? in mind, this is 1945. $4. Yeah. Which is decent. That's decent. Like... That's the amount of money that if I'm not working, I'd be like, or if it's like the weekend, I might be like, I might do it. I mean, it's just walking through the woods. Yeah. Right. They brought out like, the planes and the Boy Scouts. <laughs> yeah. The, the Boy Scouts thing is a little, every time I hear the word Boy Scouts, anytime I'm like doing anything anymore, I always get like, a, I always get a little upset. <laughs> reasonable reaction <laughs> just knowing knowing all the things that i know, like it's so remember when like it broke like all the stories about boy scouts broke right yeah a couple years ago i was confused because i was like how are people just finding out about this yeah it's <laughs> yeah that came out pretty late didn't <laughs> right well no i was confused because I was already under the assumption that that was happening. Yeah, I I, I don't know why that like, was like... I it, feel it, like... It broke then because everyone... My assumption was that like that was just the thing. Like, that's just a thing you knew. And I didn't know... Yeah. Not that it was like a common thing in conversation, but it, 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 it didn't seem like I, anything I, anyone wouldn't have known. I thought it was like an open secret. Yeah. Right? Um, that doesn't make it good, mind you. I, I just was like, I guess people don't care that this is happening to children. Yeah, like, everyone just decided right? they get a pass, like, for some reason. Yeah. But apparently, people just didn't fucking... Apparently, there were people who didn't know, which is bonkers to me. Because if you, if you are a person who is in Boy Scouts, even if you were not one of the people who got targeted, it was pretty fucking obvious what was happening. Yeah, also... You didn't, the, if didn't have know, to... Didn't, the 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 Boy Scouts of America had a list of everyone that did it and just chose to not do anything. So it's worse than you think. Yeah. So if we're being yeah. coy. It's because I don't know if we really want to talk about abuse. Yeah, uh, we don't need to make this it, darker. <laughs> oh, it's and it's gonna get darker. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. We don't need to pull the Boy Scouts of America into this. So, 
Um, anywho, uh, as the case in any good search that incorporates the U.S. Army, there was one casualty as a result of the hunt. Perf, of course. <laughs> um, while looking for Mitty, an unnamed soldier slipped and fell while crossing a stream, dislocating <laughs> his shoulder. <laughs> I was reading through, like, the articles from the time, and I don't know why, but when I read that, I just was like, this is the funniest goddamn thing I've ever seen. Because, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, um, like, it's way overkill for what they're doing, and then, of course, like, they bring in the army who, like, dislocates the army a shoulder crossing a stream. The army armied all over it. They did. Let's be real. Um... I say that having, like, a good friend who's currently in the military, and he would probably agree with me. <laughs> um, so, the search lasted for about a week, when the ownership of the search effort uh, would transfer to Mitty's son-in-law, Joe Lazone. And remember that last name. Cause okay. it's actually kind of important. Um, so, no trace of Mitty would ever be found, and speculation ran rampant as to what had happened to the elder hunter. Some suspected a heart attack or a heat stroke. Fairly reasonable conclusions for a man of his age, although it should be noted this did happen in November. So the heat stroke may be not as, um, not as probable, but still, heat stroke can happen in November. So, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, others still proposed that he had been shot and killed by another hunter accidentally, with the body being hidden to cover up the accidental murder, which is upsettingly possible in my mind. It's possible. It's... I'm leaning towards Bear. Bear? Bear. I mean, they never found his body, so... Bears eat the... Um, yeah, bears eat. They can eat bones. They don't eat the bones. I bears. ate the bones! <laughs> <laughs> I remember that curse. That happened to me once. The first, it, time, you, the first time I ever had a boneless wing, because I didn't know that was a thing, it was at someone's... Yeah. Um, Super Bowl party, and I just took a bite, and I was like, "There's no bones." <laughs> like I, 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 I like a minor panic before I realized what happened. I was like, "Oh, it's not a wing; it's a chicken tender." Ah, uh, jeez. So now, yeah, that's the thing about boneless wings; they're just chicken tenders. Like, don't don't put on airs. Don't fall for the marketing. Yeah, it's just it's just a chicken tender with like a special kind of sauce on it. Yeah. Um, just sauce your tendies. Wake, wake up, up sheeple. sheeple. They're just tendies. Um, so ultimately, Mitty River's story has no definite closure, right? Uh, had he been the only person to disappear, uh, the story would be nothing more than a tragic historical footnote, right? Likely, right? Um, and actually, there's a lot to talk about there, but we'll unpack that later. Um, but this brings us uh, a couple of years fo forward. Um, I think it's... What year was this? One year forward. There we go. Not couple. One. Uh, <laughs> so, I literally say it in the first sentence. A year after Mitty disappeared into the woods, another victim would be claimed by the alleged triangle. However, this time, it was a college-age white girl. Oh, it's a tragedy now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's how you know. Um, so, Paula Jean Weldon was an 18-year-old girl from Stamford, Connecticut. Okay. Who had been attending Bennington College as a sophomore in the more cosmopolitan city of Bennington, Vermont, about five miles away from the site of Mitty River's disappearance? So we've, we're checking off a lot of shit for for Paula Jean Weldon here. We uh, she's white. She's eighteen. She's a woman. Uh, she's in college. She comes from Stanford, Connecticut. Her father, uh, like, designed, like, fancy cocktail shakers. She's so, like, just missing Uggs and pumpkin spice. Brandon. <laughs> and then her bingo card is filled out. Brandon. Wait a fucking second. Uh-oh. <laughs> wait. So, by all accounts, it was a fairly normal day, December 1st, 1946. Paula had completed her second shift for the day in the dining hall when she returned to her dorm to study and change into her clothes for hiking. While there, she encountered a roommate, notifying her that she'd be taking a hike that afternoon. I did see some people saying that she was trying to get other people to go with her, um, but I couldn't find confirmation for that outside of Wikipedia, so take that as you will. Um, so while, while there, she encountered her roommate, 
and I said that already. Uh, <laughs> so outfitted in a red parka and Brandon yeah. fur line boots. She did have Uggs. So she I assumed Uggs. that she was basically wearing 40s North Face and Uggs. Oh, gosh. Right? Like, um, wait. No, she didn't wear fur line boots. Damn it. I read an article that lied to me. She was wearing sneakers. You know, in my narrative, in my head canon, they're Uggs. Okay. What? Let, let's let's consider them Uggs, and even though we know that they're not. There's. I know that they are. They're 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 uh, sneakers were Uggs. There. They were Snugs. Um. So she also had no cash left. Uh, no cash on her per- person. Um. And she left for the hiking trail. Right. Man, I'm so mad that I I wrote that. I wrote two pairs of shoes in this, and like I also forgot. I'm 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 slipping up, Brandon. <laughs> you're slipping. you're tripping. I'm tripping. Tripping so, and slipping. At this point in the story, Brandon, I feel like her college student logic kicks in, right? Okay. Um, and you know what I'm talking about. Like, college student logic is when you do something really fucking stupid. That if anyone, if you told anyone who was above a certain age, they'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, like college college student logic is like, yeah, I like ran across the throughway because I had to get somewhere. And it's like, and you okay. know, that, that age gap isn't, it's like, give it five years. Like, if you it's, s- it's say like, that to anyone just five years older, they'd be like, what the fuck were what you the thinking? Fuck? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's wild. I don't get it. Yeah. It it doesn't make sense. But there is like this, there's this like line where like the second you cross it, you're just like Jesus fucking Christ. What are you doing? There's no, with what I remember of my college years and what I see of my current daughter now. Between like from the moment you're born to the moment you're, I'll say twenty seven. All you're doing is trying to find ways to get yourself killed. That's it. Pretty much. For the first 27 years, you're just trying to die, and then you turn 27, and then you're like, holy shit, what just happened? Pretty much. That's yeah. pretty much the definition of life. Um, so Paula didn't have access to a car of her own, or to my knowledge, any form of transportation. But the bike trail, I mean, the 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 trail, I don't know why I said bike, uh, was about 10 miles away, which okay. Brandon... It's about a three-hour trip one way. Yeah, that's a, that's a and hike. you're going uphill. You're going uphill for a, a decent part of that in this particular story. Um, and Paula left her her dorm at two thirty p.m., which means that if she walked there, turned around, and came back, she'd be returning at eight thirty in the evening. Yeah, that's about as late college as you student want to be logic. back from a hike. <laughs> college <laughs> student logic, right? Uh, personally, this seems like a waste of a trip, uh, but as I said, as I've said, implied, I've done some really dumb time wasters in my day. Um, yeah, I've gone for dumb hikes for uh, yeah for sure. So, ultimately, however, Paula would hitch a ride most of the way there, being dropped off by a Lewis Knapp about three miles away from the Long Trail trailhead. Um, so this last the last sighting of her, however. Uh, occurs at 4 p.m. on the trail with Paula asking for directions about the length of the trail, which is like 257 <sighs> miles, by the way. Yeah, it's cheat. Uh... It's called Long Trail because it's long. Like, she will get um, to the trail at the time she would, would have wanted to have been finishing with the trail. This So this is this is the kind of trail that has campsites along it, because you're expected not to make the trail, like complete the trail in a in a day, in a, yeah. night, a sitting, right? So you're you're expected to camp out along the trail, right? Because That's of how long the trail is. It is it is an incredibly <laughs> long trail, Brandon. Like incredibly. So like it, it's not called long trail for nothing. No. Um. But she was seen multiple times as she was like you know moving through the trail like multiple people like laid eyes on her at every step of this it's just when she asked for directions not seen after that right okay um so 
it was 50 degrees Fahrenheit that December afternoon. However, it's December. <laughs> so as night fell, temperatures plummet to nine degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, and perfect. three inches of snow begins to accumulate. That's Paula perfect. is for, for, for our, our Celsius buddies. That's below zero. Yes. Yes. So Paula is explicitly underdressed for the inclement le- weather and would never be seen again. Right. So fair that I uh, don't want to victim shame, but there's there's a lot that we're going to have to unpack here. Th- there's all of the things to not do were done. Yes, but, like, let's just take a second. Let's continue through the story, because there's a little bit more context that uh, it makes things more depressing. Um, Oh, good. So, despite concerns for her roommate not returning for that that night, Paula would not be reported missing until the following day when she failed to show up for class. See, that makes sense. Uh, If you're in college and you have a roommate and your roommate is out, you just assume that they're, like partying or out for a hookup or just like got drunk I mean, on the way back from Domino's or whatever like so I didn't put this in the I didn't put this in the, the copy but um Bennington College had a policy where if you're gonna like leave at a certain time you'd have to like sign out yeah and but when was the last time anyone of that age ever <laughs> like followed the rules like that I can't argue that that's true but uh she didn't sign out or sign back in which could be an important like factor in determining what happened. Um, but regardless, her dis- disappearance would ser- be seriously noted, right? Uh, the admission director of the, of the college called the state attorney to the college noon that day. That's an escalation <laughs> for sure. Uh, and her father was promptly notified of her absence. Now, official searches uh, didn't start immediately, in part because Vermont had no state police force, which is kind of insane, Um, but also because there was immediate confusion about the timeline of events that Paula had taken, right? Like the the steps that she had taken in her journey. Yeah. Um, the, The Massachusetts and New York state police were notified of it and, like, were pulled in, uh, but, like, there was, like, a, a bit of a lag between that and like an official investigation. Um, So a taxi driver claimed to have dropped her off at a bus station. And meanwhile, a waitress claimed to have seen her with a 25 year old man who was drunk and abusive. And I want to point out, this is 1946. So Jesus Christ, that must have been awful for it to get called out in the the forties. Yes. Yeah. That must've been some rough time. Rough stuff is all I can say. Like, um, to be noticeably, this was in the, you know, like, this is from a news article, right? So to be yeah. drunk and abusive enough in the 40s to make a newspaper? Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, so the the woman, who may or may not have been Paula, uh, appeared distressed and was trying to make her way back to Bennington. Supposedly, she had $1,000 at some point, but lost it all. And for reference, that is $14,000 in in today money that doesn't sound like a college kid like college kid money it sounds like rich white college kid money yeah, oh yeah i forgot this is you, what you have to say stanford or something yeah she's from stanford so like yeah. you have to take that into account um authorities would eventually surmise that this was an entirely separate girl so there were two women who looked kind of like Paula at the same time with bad shit happening to him. And I know nothing about what happens to this woman, the one who's like with the abusive person. D- her story just disappears after that. So like, I'm not going to say f- if you wear Uggs, you deserve whatever would happen. But no, Brandon. Uggs. Brandon. Uggs. I mean... There's there's some ethical dilemmas because isn't it like lambskin or something like that? It's well, it's leather. They're they're real. They're, it's shitty leather, but it's leather. Yeah, if but you're a shoe nerd, check out Roseanneville on YouTube. He's a leather worker that cuts apart really expensive shoes and tells you whether or not they're worth it. 
That's pretty amazing. It do- he does Uggs and like Yeezys and all that stuff. And Uggs, <laughs> disturbingly shit. <laughs> I I can't imagine Yeezys are worth it either. You know what? You'd be surprised. Some of them are actually um, uh, like. You are paying for, like, the designer, like, name brand aspect, but also, like, surprisingly, a number of them, you're like, they're actually really well built, you know, and then it's up to you yeah. to decide if the markup for the designer name is worth it, but they are but, better than, than, like, standard shoes. they're shoes. also ugly as sin. Some of them aren't. Some of them... So I some of them look like you gave a nine year old playing Fortnite acid and told them to make fucking shoes out of marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Yeezys. Uh, anywho, so uh, a Tuesday, the community searches began. Right, uh, they scanned the path that they approximated Paula had taken, and it was determined that she was last seen near a camp called Hunter's Rest, which was owned by William Lazan. Okay, and. I can only assume that he was related to Joe from Mitty's story. In a town that small, he has to be. Yeah, but also, this is they're also close to Bennington as well, so things get like a little fucky-wucky. Mm. Um, but to add a wrinkle to the mystery, Lazan claimed that three servicemen, similarly in appropriate clothes, left for the hike, uh, for the hike, left a suitcase with him, never to return early there that Saturday. Sunday. So, same day, um... Three men show up, leave a suitcase, they're named, and then I hear, I, I see nothing about them again in the story. Oh, okay, good, okay. That's what there's, we like there's to an see. Im- there's an implication that they might have done something, but it's just, like, left hanging. Yeah. So, uh, Wednesday night, the college issued a statement stating that indicating that the authorities had suspected that Paula had not simply disappeared and that her body had been hidden by perpetrators. Searches were intense, with about 500 people looking for Paula, including several aircraft. That's crazy. Well, she's a she's a lost white college girl, so that's crazy. Um. In fact, the number of searches was such that confetti was used to mark areas that had been searched in order to prevent overlap. That's not that's not the worst idea. No, it's not, but that's also that also means there was a fuck ton of people looking. Yeah, 500. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately Paula would not be found and the search would stop on December 15th with a two, short two-day search after the snow melted in the spring. Now, as a side note, Paula's disappearance is responsible for the creation of the Vermont State Police. Oh, good. (laughs) Because of issues involving the investigation and collaboration with law enforcement within the state, which uh, I wish I could say was bonkers to me. Um, But because like the, the response in my read is like, if anything, excessive. Yeah. Right? Because, like, the fucking state attorney was called day one. <laughs> right? Like, it seemed like it seemed like they were on top of things to me. Right? Yeah. But I will say this. Paula is 100% an example of the more dead. Yeah. Uh, which, if you don't listen to True Prime podcasts, uh, that's basically, like, there's less That's dead people and more who dead. will be noticed. Yeah. yeah, less dead is like sex workers and people of color and you know all that kind of stuff. And more dead is pretty blonde white girl falling down the well. Yeah, right. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that a girl from an affluent family uh, who got lost is responsible for the creation of the state police. Because, yeah, because like it's it's police- almost. Not surprising that they waited that long to establish a formal police department because it it wasn't until I forget how old I was, but I was old enough to remember getting a house number for when my house got a number on the street. Like prior to that, like if you needed to call nine one one or whatever, there was no house number. If you needed a packet, there was no house. It was just <laughs> the post office. <laughs> you know? Wild. Yeah, like 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 I'm old enough to remember like oh we we now have a number that says what our house is. 
See, I always had a number on my house, but I grew up in Kingston initially, right? Yeah. And and of course, Kingston has more numbering, right? Because like it's a city. Yeah, the first city. Hell yeah, Bazinga! Oh, poo. Why are you saying the first city? Because it's not the first city. It's the first capital of New York, if that's what you're thinking. Yeah. That's all that matters. Okay, okay cool. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so, mundane ex- explanations do exist for Paula's disappearance, right? Uh, a common one indicates that she had been depressed, uh, in part due to not spending Thanksgiving with her family. However, the night before her disappearance, she was unusually happy. And... If you're not somebody who is familiar with, like, depression, uh, in chronically depressed individuals, that's kind like, with suicidal ideation, which this is where the trigger warning comes in, uh, that's usually a warning sign, right? Yeah. Um, although we don't know if she was suicidal, right? We don't know. We don't know her mental state. So this is just speculation. Um also, it could have been that she had a mood shift where she was like, I'm going to do something different with my life, right? And she yeah. decided. There is a chance that if she had a mood shift to being happy from being sad, uh, she had made a decision, right? And she was going to do something. That is a possibility. Um, additionally, there's the hypothesis that was crafted at the time, uh, which she was murdered by an unknown individual and subsequently hidden in the woods, which is possible. Right. I mean, she's it's not a, impossible. She's a woman in the forties, so that means it was hysteria. Her vagina drove her insane. It was it was hysteria, and that's what drove. Was that's why she was suddenly happy and why she ran into the woods. Was hysteria still a thing in the forties? It has to have been. <laughs> I mean, I know you could get lobotomized for being a woman. So. Yeah, serves you right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> However, Brandon, this is Cryptopedia, so we're going to talk about some potential apocrypha and mysterious humanoids of unknown prominence, because that's just what we fucking do. Hell yeah. So, we're in the American Northeast, Brandon, so it should not surprise you that there are uh, indigenous legends claimed to be surrounding the area in the Bennington Triangle, because that's just what Northeastern America does. Indeed. It's what we do best. Uh, Yeah. In this case, the Glastonbury Mountain, uh, as with the Triangle itself, is the epicenter of legend. Historically, the region was inhabited by members of the Wabanaki Confederation. People of Dawn is what that means. Um, Particularly the Abenaki people. An Algonquin-speaking tribe that was forced out during the so-called French and Indian War by the British in the colonial era. So... There were there was an indigenous group of Algonquin speakers who lived in this region, um, and they're the people who these stories get laid on because that's what happens. Uh, Joe Citro, the man who confer- who coined the term Bennington Triangle, alleged that there was a history of legends surrounding the mountain, which was known, according to him, as the place where the four winds meet. Moreover, the land was considered cursed as the winds at the peak erratically changed direction. Uh, some allege that the Abenaki version of the Great Spirit, Gishi Niwask uh, Talbdak in the source, lived uh, at the top of the mountain, furthering the taboo sacred nature of the space, right? So, um, one of the things in like, uh, indigenous lore in America is like, mountains are kind of like these sacred spaces, right? Um, and... Yeah, because they're like, cool as hell. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 if you climb the mountain, it's like a spiritual journey, theoretically yeah. right um but I, I think that's like a common trend in all of his human history like climbing mountains has like this almost spiritual implication so like even if you're talking about like you know europeans you're still like it, it's a different stance right because you're mm-hmm. like dominating the mountain but it's still like at its core some form of like spiritualism it's just a question of whether or not you're dominating or becoming in tune, right? But regardless, that's neither here nor there because that has no bearing on the story whatsoever. <laughs> um, bizarrely, Brandon, there was a man-eating stone on the mountain, apparently. Oh, hell yeah. Womp. Uh, according to... Huh? Womp. That's the noise it makes when it eats people. That When it belly flops onto you. Womp. Womp. <laughs> this is... Whap. Oh god, what was that level from Super Mario with Womp Womp? 
Thwomps? Yeah. Are you talking about Thwomps? Yeah, the Womps. The Thwomps. Was it just... Is it... And then there was the owl. You could jump up and grab the owl's legs and they all get the, 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 the star. Mm. Which which Mario game are you even talking about? Mario 64. I don't remember an owl in Mario 64. Yeah, there was an owl. Uh, Womp Fortress. Yeah, there was a level... Oh, it's literally called Womp's Fortress. At, on okay. the Womp's Fortress level, there was an owl where you could jump up, grab its legs, and then you could fly the owl and drop into a cage holding a star. A uh, womp is a womp is the the walking one. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, you know, they it didn't walk around. I think it just stays still and it just captures people. Um, like a Venus flytrap, but stone. Pretty much, okay. but rock. So, once again, returning to Joe Citro, no living person has actually seen the anomaly in action. However, he speculates that the rock was large enough to stand on, uh, because. Yeah, I guess. Uh, according sure. to his telling, when a victim stands on the rock, it is no longer solid, eating the unfortunate victim by just, like, letting it fall th- fall into it. Um, I'll save my assessment of these claims until after I've unfolded all the paranormal nonsense. Okay. Uh, but rest assured, it's not favorable. Neither is my assessment of Joe Citro, but we'll get to that. Um, and Brandon, I've got a little picture of the man-eating stone. Uh, yeah, it's got there. eyes. It looks like the cover of like an old horror movie almost, where it's just like the stone and yeah. then just an arm like shooting out the top trying to grab something. It, it's pretty good. It kind of has like Evil Dead vibes to it. Yeah. If I had to put, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, So furthermore, Brandon, Tales of the Region wouldn't be complete without the addition of a Bigfoot-like monster that inhabits the region, right? Just simply, if there's not a if there's not a humanoid, like what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Um, conspicuously, I couldn't find any indigenous stories about the monster. However, I did find some reporting from later inhabitants of the region on obscurevermont.com. So the story goes that in the early 1800s, a stage coast was forced to stop on as the road had become washed out by a fierce storm. Uh, jumping to examine the condition of the road, the driver hopped down, lantern in hand, to discover a, a set of widely spaced, unknown footprints. Given the active storm, the footprints were still likely fresh, belonging to something large because of the long gate. As he looked at the tracks, he noticed the horses were getting spooked by something. At this point, I'm confused by the story, because something then attacks the carriage, resulting in the passengers fleeing the vehicle. Right? Yeah. But somehow also the driver ends up with the passengers. So I'm a little like, I'm not sure whether, like, I feel like when I read it the first time, I thought that the driver was in the passenger, like, carriage. And I'm like, how the fuck did that happen? So I'm not sure if I just, I had a a reading comprehension failure or if the story is just really confusing. Yeah. Um, Anywho, they flee the carriage and uh, the attacks being so aggressive. Uh, it ultimately knocks the whole thing onto its side. Uh, isolated in the driving rain, the dark in, in the dark, the group then alleges to have seen two large eyes in the darkness staring at them. The party got a vague sight of the creature, placing it around eight feet tall as it shambled back into the woods. Mm. Sus- so it's a suspicious story. I can't think of any animal that would do that. Just attack a stagecoach. No. no. Yeah, I mean, it's it's unlikely. It's really unlikely. Um, while dubbed the Bennington Monster, this be- beast reeks of classic aggressive Bigfoot story, right? Um, although its placement in Vermont is a bit of an outlier regarding Bigfoot aggression, which we've talked about in the past. Um, yeah. Because I'm like, because Northeastern Bigfoot are usually a little less aggressive than you gotta like, get to the, to the Midwest. Yeah, before they get yeah. angry. Yeah, well, that's because they're in the Midwest. So... That's they're pissed off because pizza. It's just not di- good. It, it's it's deep dish pizza is not fucking pizza. You put too much bullshit on your hot dogs. There's so much going on over there. To be fair, to be fair, a Dallas hot wiener has a lot of bullshit on the hot dog, and I fucking love those. It's 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 one ingredient worth of bullshit. Like it's just 
that sauce. No. It's hot dog yeah, and but, then sauce. It's not like but hot the dog sauce and then sauce. It's got multiple things. There's multiple things in the sauce, like, but it's not like they're there's putting There's onion. A fucking... I think there's like some kind of hot sauce in there. There's onion, hot sauce, meat of questionable origin. But it, it, yeah. it's it's not like there's a garden salad on it. It's True. just a ladle. Okay. They put a, a single ladle of shit on it, and then you're good to go. And the shit makes it taste way better. Yeah. It tastes like more hot dog. It's like you're doubling the amount of hot dog in a single hot dog. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful flavor. Um... Historically speaking, as we've said, n- Northeastern Bigfoot are more docile. Um, however, I'm not even sure if the story is apocrypha because, like, it there's like nothing to it. Like, I found several articles talking about the existence of the monster. However, none pointed to a primary source of the tale. So, like, did the legend come before the appear- disappearances or after? I don't fucking know. Right? I don't know if this yeah. was something that was made to like like bolster the disappearances. So, who the fuck knows? So, um, while there's not much gristle on the UFO angle, some do allege, and by some, I mean Joe Citro, <laughs> that there's... <laughs> this guy. There's, yeah, there's alien activity in the region. Many of today's sources claim it's a hotbed of UFO activity. But I literally could only find one source for sightings in the region, and yes, it was Joe Citro. Oh, he perfect. He reported in his book... Yeah, his book, Green Mountain Ghosts, Ghouls, and Unsolved Mysteries, that Don Pratt had seen a flying silo in September of 1984. Allegedly, six other witnesses had seen the craft, with one looking at it through the scope of a rifle, noting strange markings on the side before it disappeared. Now, Brandon, this is the most commonly cited sighting for this particular region. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about fucking Don Pratt and his goddamn flying silo, right? Yeah. Um, But it's bizarre because in that same fucking book, Brandon... There is a much better alien story. <laughs> of course. Like, there's. like literally the next sentence after uh Don Pratt's story ends, there yep. is a much, much better story. And I have no idea why everyone talks about the fucking silo when this is a story. So September 19th, uh, 1984. So, like, you know, same month. Miss Hurley was driving her pickup along Orber Road near Bennington. Uh, she was hurrying to pick up a babysitter when she saw a bright light in the road in front of her. <laughs> she thought, it's a Jeep, she thought. <laughs> Which, what? <laughs> so she sounded her horn. The Jeep got out of her way. All right. Uh, miss, and that's what that's written. That's written in the in the. In, I it, took it literally says literal all right in the scan. <laughs> the jeep got out of her way, comma all right. This is the exact wording in the book. Um, miss Hurley reports it rose into the air and floated over the cab of her truck. As it chased above, as it passed above her, she felt a horrible burning sensation in her cheek. Frightened, she turned around and drove home. Meaning she didn't go pick up a babysitter. Um, (laughs) Feeling dizzy and nauseated. When her husband saw that her skin was covered by little boils, he insisted that she visit the doctor at once. The doctor said she was suffering from prickly heat. Brandon, that is so much more, like, interesting of a story than, yeah, that fucking dude saw a silo. Yeah, that's a way better story. Like, a way better story. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Weird writing aside, it is a much better story. Why the fuck wouldn't you lead with that one? You're burying the goddamn lead. Yeah. Fucking Joe fucking, Citro. Fucking bullshit. Well, it's just fascinating to me that every single person who wrote the articles picked the fucking boring story and not the interesting one. It's, I mean, it's Vermont. But Brandon, it's not just from like Vermont. It's like a bunch of fucking... There's a fucking fuckload of stories across the the country from a variety of different. Uh, yeah, but when in doubt, blame Vermont. That's uh, uh, no, that's all I got. I'm just <laughs> upset, Brandon. I'm just really, really fucking upset. Okay. Um, the remaining stories though are like almost all. I saw something in the sky. 
Which which makes it more fascinating to me that Miss Hurley's story is not the one people go to because it's a fucking like close encounter of the third kind type story. Yeah, right. She supposedly is got so like much... physical injuries from her UFO sighting, which is crazy. Like, how often does that even come up on any modern story? If they just left incredibly, it incredibly, incredibly common, actually. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's like a whole thing. There's this is oh god, this isn't getting gonna get into like Morgellons territory, is it? Morgellons? Yeah, more uh the Morgellons disease in air quotes. It's um. People like think will have like pocket lint on their shoulder and think like they were abducted by an alien and they deposited a tracker onto them. <laughs> it's the craziest shit. Uh, excuse me, this is the first time hearing of this. You've never okay. Explore this rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, more right. gallons. Well, I guess Pe- I got. People will have like, f- like, air quotes mysterious fibers and then assume that the mysterious fiber on their bo- person was from deposited on them after a UFO abduction, but it all always comes back to like nylon or polyester, just like shirt fibers. And for That's some nice. reason they like I don't know what it's almost like a like a like a like an obsessive compulsion type like no, this has to be from a UFO or whatever that they, they It it kinda sounds like Munchausen a little bit. Almost, but it's not inherited right? from a parent. Right, Munchausen, Munchausen is, is, is no, I think, usually instilled from a, a, a like a parent has it, and then they no, like instill it in you. Or at least you're the talking about I've Munchausen. Heard. You're talking about Munchausen by proxy. That's oh, when the yes. Parent says that's that's different. Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen by proxy are two very different things. Munchausen syndrome is from the person, and it's about themselves. Yeah. Munchausen by proxy is when somebody says that their child has a serious problem to draw attention towards themselves because that's like, and they're using, they're using medical stuff for it, but that's the one I'm familiar with. Not, this is not the like focus of the podcast. So go listen to a pod, go listen to like fucking Sawbones. I'm sure they've done a Munchausen syndrome episode somewhere. Um, so at this point I want to pivot to highlight that this is more or less the pattern for stories relating to the Bennington triangle. I'll find an article that talks about the region. Sourcing the claim, I'll find references to another article, which ultimately, as I follow the rabbit hole, goes back to Joe Citro, the person who coined the term for the region. Um, For example, when I was looking into the Abenaki story, Providence, I went to one site called The Travel, which then led to The Grunge, and then I hit a dead end at a podcast with a defunct website and no (laughs) fucking sources, because I did find the podcast, and they didn't list any of their goddamn sources which pissed me off um i then backed up and looked at examples of the claims and realized that joe citro had written the weird new england book right uh i got access to the book because it's available for like you can rent it or you can uh, take it out on archive.org um found the article about the triangle made all the same claims about the abenaki beliefs which makes me think okay Joe Citro is probably the person who's responsible for this because everything kind of terminates with this motherfucker. So then I found another blog post, right? And this yeah. was from the Green Mountain Club because I was trying to figure out what the original name of Glattensbury Mountain was, right? Uh, because there is a claim that it's the where four winds meet, right? Yeah. Turns out uh, the person on... That blog explicitly calls out Joe Citro saying his claims are unsubstantiated about the Abenaki lore in the region. And in fact, the Abenaki name for the Gladensbury Mountains has not survived. (laughs) It was lost to history, meaning the place where the four winds meet is a full on fabrication. (laughs) There is no doubt. I don't know if Joe Citro is responsible for it, but it is absolutely a fabrication. At some point in this chain, someone made up that name. Um, so, in short, the supernatural elements of this story are more or less made up by Joe Citro. <laughs> or at the very least, they originate from Joe Citro. But, Brandon, before we finish this episode, we still have three more disappearances to talk about. There's, I just like that the, the Charlie Day 
wall in your bedroom that I imagine of thumbtacks and red red string all point to like just a a blurred photograph of Joe Citro. Scroll down to the sources, Brandon, just to see how many fucking sources I tried to like go through for this fucking episode. <laughs> no, John. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I, I tried my best. Yeah, I tried my best to track this motherfucker down and pin it down. You got 24. Why do you have 24? Because I needed to, I needed to find out. <laughs> I needed to know where it came from. That's too many. That's all. No, it's it's just enough. Um, so, Brandon, the next person disappear. And, like, actually, of all the disappearances, this is the strangest one to me, to be fair. But I still think it has a mundane explanation. So... The next person to disappear from the region was James Tedford on December 1st, 1949, precisely three years after Paula Weldon had vanished. James Tedford was a 68-year-old man. Once again, we got an old man in the story. Lots uh, of the elderly was, getting lost in the woods. Yeah, he was also a um, he was also a veteran, which they mentioned multiple times, which I don't think it has any bearing on anything, but whatever. Um he was on a bus headed towards his retirement home in Bennington after having visited family in St. Albans, Vermont. James got on the bus at St. Albans, noted by several witnesses alongside 14 other passengers. There was a consensus that he had been sleeping on his seat during the trip and that he was still on the bus on the last stop before Bennington, meaning he hadn't gotten off before Bennington, right? Which yeah. Where his retirement home was. However, as the bus pulled into the Bennington stop, James was nowhere to be seen. Interestingly, his belongings were still on the luggage rack, and a bus table sat open in his now vacant seat. None of the other passengers, nor the driver, had seen the man leave the bus. It should be noted, however, uh, they also described him as nondescript. Okay. So, um... So, you know, he wasn't really an attention grabber which yeah. might be important. Um, also, his disappearance was not the first to occur in his immediate family. With his much younger wife, 29 years his junior. Damn, he must have been uh, loaded. Apparently, she had disappeared 12 years prior without a trace. Damn. Also, Brandon, this is the this is the 40s, so like... And this is 12 years before that, so that's like the 30s, so... It can't even be his dick, because his dick don't work. He's 68. Well, he was 57 at the time, I think. Still, that's well past when the on button still works on it. <laughs> it's not true. There's... Not for everyone. For some people, yeah. For... Not everyone. <laughs> for... <laughs> for... For everyone that overshares in the office where I work, that is true. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, they, they overshare an old man. <laughs> They're all over sharing old men. Um, oh, they overshare so much. It's pretty great. I hate it. I hate it. Uh, so accounts noted that after her disappearance, he was fucking miserable. Uh, withdrawing from social circles and becoming a miserable recluse who was barely ever seen leaving his house and did did not do much but sit alone and stare at the wall. So he was in a good mental I state. Mean, Gosh, they're, they're, like, that's not too far from some points of me. <laughs> I'm like, man, that sounds pretty great. But, Brandon, like, let's be real. Uh, this kind of suggests a, a little bit of a sad end for James that wasn't anomalous. Oh, in that, like, yeah. It, despite, claim, like, you know, also people were claiming that he had been acting no more different, no differently. Which, Brandon, he's not normally in a good headspace, so that doesn't really instill he's confidence in me. 68, his behavior changed like that, and if anyone has any no, experience didn't. with the elderly, like, elderly relatives, everyone's had the uh, older relative I, that's like, I'm just praying for God to take me now. Like, I, I kind of I, like, I I, feel like he just catted it. Yeah. You know how like cats just disappear? Yeah, I feel yeah. Like he just turned, I, think, I feel like he just embodied a cat. He probably, I think that's I, I would believe that. I wouldn't find that surprising. I mean, it, it's weird, but like, and it's sad, but like, I don't know if this is like, this is not like, 
of all of the the ones that we're going to talk about, this is like not shocking to me. It's no. depressing as fuck, but it's not shocking. It's an older person uh, lost a loved one and then catted it. Yeah. So the next to disappear, Brandon, would be Paul Jepson on October 12th, 1950. This time it was an eight-year-old boy who had last been seen by his mother before she would go to tend the pigs at the local dump where her husband worked. Now, uh, after he disappeared, uh, a bloodhound was called in uh, that was able to trace his scent from the last location he had been seen to a nearby crosswords, at which rich point the trail just ceases. Now, Brandon, uh-huh. Occam's razor here tells you exactly what happened to Paul. There's a white that fan is, that, that had to come up that day. <laughs> yeah, he almost definitely was abducted. Like, I yeah. have zero doubt in my mind that he was abducted because, like, they're they're able to track the trail of his scent until a crossroads. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, you don't have to be fucking... Perot to figure this one out. No, that that that, that yeah, those the, um those dots are pretty close together. They're not hard to connect. Yeah, th- this is this is like I I barely even need like instructions to connect those two dots. It's like putting instructions on the on the heel of a boot for how to pour water out of it. Why is your boot filled with water? Well, there's instructions on the heel to tell you how to pour the water out. Oh, actually, I, I redact that. My 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 uncle. I have an uncle who lives in Texas, and apparently, if you're in Texas, someone will have to confirm this for me. There's a thing that you do with your boots to make them fit better, and that you Clay? you fill them with water and wear them wet, and I guess that like gives them a custom fit. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, weird. I've heard of that. Yeah. Um. So, but Brandon, his father believed him to have been caught by the lure of the mountains. What does that even mean? Apparently he'd been talking about the mountains like incessantly for the days prior to disappearance. Um, Like he was like obsessed with them or something. But Brandon, uh, honestly, this sounds like an explanation. That's like a coping mechanism because that's a lot of copium because uh, I mean, you can talk a lot about anything, but I don't think the mountains will have like a hypnotic draw that will like cause like lure children into that. Like that's yeah, that's yeah. I I mean this this just sounds like something bad happened to his son. That's he, like kind of unthinkable, and he just yeah like, he he's he smoking copium. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the fifth and uh, final of the string of disappearances. There is another. There's another one that's sometimes cited, but it it wasn't in a lot of sources, so I didn't bother including it. Um, the fifth of the string of disappearances happened two weeks later on October twenty eighth, nineteen fifty. Frida Langer, a 53-year-old experienced hiker and survivalist familiar with the area, disappeared after taking a half-mile hike with her cousin, Herbert Eisner. Frida fell into a stream, getting wet in the cold autumn air. Needing to change clothes, she decided to return to camp alone. However, she would never make it back to camp where her husband had been resting his knee. The ensuing hunt pulled 400 people, helicopters, more soldiers, and just even more people to, to search for the lost woman. She would never be found alive, Brandon. However, she would be found. Six months after disappearing in April of 1951, her body was found near the Somerset Reservoir, an open area that had been checked multiple times during the initial source. The woman's body at that point, however, had been too badly decomposed to identify the source of her death. Now, I think I think if you're talking about paranormal at this point, you're thinking like people would be thinking uh, alien abduction. Yeah, but this this alternate is literally, dimension. This is literally not the first time I've heard this story happen. Yeah, because there was a recent disappearance out like in California of a woman, uh, and they searched the area. She wasn't there, and then they found her body in the same area that they searched. So, like, it's a thing that happens. Yeah. And it it could be a a few things. It could be someone, like, if you're trying to hide a body, 
if you know they yeah. searched a spot, maybe put it back where they already searched and assume maybe they yeah. won't go back, or maybe she slipped into an alternate dimension where, like, just time flows differently, and then when she slipped no. back out, of course, like, she was already dead, but because time works differently, then that's why it was decomposed and showed back later, because it, it was always there, they just couldn't see it, because it was in the, the mirror dimension. All right, well, let's, let's not. <laughs> let's not. That's, that's, okay. no, 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 no. I mean, realistically speaking, she was probably murdered or abducted, right? Like, yeah. Like, if we're being completely honest, um, like uh, once again, Occam's razor, bad stuff happened to this woman. It's unfortunate, but like, it's what it is, right? Um, so what's happening here, Brandon? Um, the paranormal explanations of the Bennington Triangle are almost definitely bullshit. Right, I'm like 90% sure Joe Citro came up with it to sell books. Um, but the five cases do share some interesting similarities, I will admit. Uh, all, all five took place in the later ha- latter half of the year after fall was in full swing, with two happening in October, one November, and two in December. So there was a, there was a pretty like ha- good di- like concentration of when all these events were happening, right? Um Having been to that country, part of the country, it really does start getting cold in September. Right? Yeah, like, like, really legitimately cold. Uh, moreover, the Glattensbury Mountains are known for having winds shift quickly and the weather, weather rapidly changing. Uh, modern stories in the region uh, recount sudden thunderstorms and fast-setting fog banks. In fact, locals have been known to get lost on well-traveled trails due to conditions in the region. Like one person was on the trail. And uh, like a fog bank fell immediately. Oh yeah, like, out of nowhere. And he had to like camp out for the night. And he also had gotten lost and like missed the trailhead or something. It's it's those will fuck you up. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty like easy to get lost in that area just because of the weather conditions. Yeah. Um. Uh, also, there's a lot of open cellar holes in the vicinity of Glattensbury. Uh, because the town was just fucking abandoned. <laughs> um, yeah. So, like, there's just hit it, holes hidden by grass in the area. So, like, for an experienced hiker, it's super dangerous. For an inexperienced hiker, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, if I had to guess, Brandon, I'd say that several of the victims fell victim to hypothermia. Um, uh-huh. My guess is that Paula and uh, Mitty died of hypothermia, right? Um, because that just seems to track for me. Yeah. Uh, especially Paula, because she was like underdressed and like you know what have you. Um, but there's also this thing in hypothermia where uh, if you're in the final stages, you'll do a thing called uh, there's there's a behavior called terminal burrowing, right? So what you'll do is you'll find a place, you'll hide in it, and then you'll die because you're yeah. hypothermic, right? It's it's just what our brains do. It's 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 like kind of aligned with paradoxical undressing. I like, was just gonna bring that up, paradoxical yeah. undressing, because when people do that, they're commonly found in really weird positions, which may be you know part of this yeah. this uh, uh, terminal burrowing thing where you just get yeah. naked and dig. Yeah. yeah. So like like. And not only that, but this is a this is a forest with a lot of nooks and crannies. It's got crazy conditions. It's incredibly likely that she just passed and was like curled up in a ball under some roots. Yeah, right. Uh, that's my my guess, but I could be wrong. Um, for the last two cases, I'm like ninety percent sure that was foul play. Right, like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not my place to speculate, but like, if we're being real, that's the easiest explanation. Uh huh. So, and then the middle dude has no bearing on any of this. Yeah. Any of those. Um, so ultimately, despite Joe Sistro's insistence that the Bennington Triangle uh, seem <laughs> Bennington Triangle is bullshit. Joe Sistro <laughs> came up with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, it's more surprising that there's so few disappearances in the region. If if five is the number that they go with for five years, that's pretty good numbers. Yeah. Like, that's let's be not real. bad. That's not bad. 
That's not bad for a rural area that has people visiting hiking. Five is a pretty decent number. It could be way fucking worse. It could be. It could just be because the, 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 the population density is so low, they're just making a, a thing about Yeah, but, things. like, even still, even still, like, it's it's not bad numbers. No. Not bad numbers. That's all I'm going to say. But, yeah, so that was the paranormal area that's really not fucking paranormal that I found. <laughs> I found it. I found it on, like, so I was looking through Reddits because sometimes I'll do that because yeah. the cryptids wiki was not being cooperative for me this wasn't week yielding any good results no i wasn't finding anything i wasn't i wasn't yielding any like good juicy stories so i started looking for like alien stories um i also found an alien story that i might cover but i think it's gonna have to go into grab bag because the story itself is like really lean yeah um but uh and it's, it's actually kind of an interesting story not because it's like anything but because it's just interesting it's got a good story like cadence to it um but i found this on like a fortian website like a fortian subreddit yeah and oh i was like oh this looks like there's enough for an episode so i started writing it and then i'm like oh there's like barely any paranormal shit in here <laughs> fuck it we're gonna do it because there's the whole fucking joe citro angle which is weird and the fact that it appeared in weird new uh new england claiming to be paranormal i think that gives us a pass yeah um but anyways, this has been the podcast. Uh, if you enjoy the podcast, be sure to check out our website, cryptopediacast.com. Our Instagram and Twitter are at cryptopediacast. And if you want to email us, cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. We also have Patreon, and we thank our jackalopes every week. So, Brandon, let's thank our jackalopes. Yes, we will thank Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Lenwood Sharp, Matthew Kelso, Bush Cr- So oh, I jumped a couple lines. You you Matthew, combined like three names there. I did. Matthew Smith, Bushcraft Kelso, and Will Smith. Uh, all of whom uh, uh, we appreciate. Their, their support directly goes to so, you know supporting the website, getting John Spirit boxes. Mm-hmm. Cool to stuff. To be fair. Like that. I will. The next time that I see you, I will bring the spirit box. Oh, we can do some spook hunting. Yeah. You know. Oh. Mm, I. 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 There was a. See, I'm. I'm working on it. There was a dark joke I had. It made it into my mm-hmm. brain, but then I stopped mm-hmm. it. Good. Good. <laughs> Good. I mean, it. It doesn't cause me any trouble because you just have to edit more. When you make bad jokes, when you make like truly vi- like truly gross jokes, yeah. <laughs> so like, it's no skin off my back. It's entirely on you. Uh, I guess you just learn from from the punishment of having to edit it out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, if you enjoy the podcast, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, if you have monster requests or stories, send them to me, uh, so I can you know use them on my I can use them to keep alive because you know I like to do things last minute I'm <laughs> fucking you know what the weirdest thing is Brandon in my job in the things that I do I don't fucking do things last minute I do things way way in advance yeah but this this I do last minute every single time it's like <laughs> I D&D. don't know how I and don't you know what the know weirdest how. thing is the weirdest thing is I fucking love talking about shit on this podcast with you so it's not even that I don't like like the end result i just wait until the last minute every time same fucking thing happened when i was a dm i loved dming but i always waited until the last minute to prep this (laughs) i will never in a million years understand why the fuck i do that i don't know only for stuff i love doing if i don't love doing it i finish it immediately that see I can't do that. Like, if if I only had three days to to put something together, even if I already had all of the material prepped and I just had to, like, sort through it, um, that's not enough to... <laughs> I, I, I'm also very used to synthesizing content really quickly. Okay. Because, so. like, for, well, for one I just wrote, I had a series of news articles where it was all... I just came across this really a, a nice well of of uh, archived newspapers that spelled everything out for me. And that still took me five days <laughs> to like put together. I'm 
I'm just very, very rapid. And I, uh, to be fair, um, the pressure, if I put pressure on myself, I tend to be way, way quicker with stuff. Okay. Which might be part of the reason why I do it. Oh, maybe. Um, it's it's not healthy. <laughs> no, but hey, it's it gets not the good job for done. Me. It gets the job done. It's not good for me, but it does the thing. So it's, it's all it's got to do. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. Uh, don't go there. I I read did the whole thing to look like a food brand and then got locked out of Twitter. Um, my email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com and my Twitter is at crypto brandon at Heinz Canada and the indefinitely locked forever at Boyer Foods, which by me transferring some background data unlocked my Heinz Canada account. Which is the weirdest fucking thing. Why is... why? I just can't believe that the one that's actually, like, borderline the one, legit... It's, the one that is as legit as it could get is banned because I transferred the email from the actually violating terms and conditions account to that one because apparently when they lock your account... They're locking the email associated with the account, not the handle of the account itself, because those you can change at will. As long as someone doesn't have it taken, you can change it as many times as you want, as often as you want, so there's no way for them to lock that down. It's the email. <laughs> so by making a stupid email for the fake account to try to make a real food brand that locked my real food brand, but freed up the one that I gave the bullshit email. <laughs> oh, those silly bastards. Ah, uh, Brandon. Anywho, if you want to follow me, I'm uh, on Instagram at Mew2057. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website's johndunhamgames.com. And my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com. And his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. And um, the, the Always Sunny in Philadelphia is still posting his uh, artwork on their, their Instagram podcast. So. <laughs> You nice. could still see some of that there if you're interested. Um, as always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. <laughs> also, uh, turns out, Leroy Jenkins? Yeah? Racist caricature. Okay. Like, yeah. from, from World of Warcraft? Yeah. 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 I buy it. Yeah. I mean, if you could remember the fact that at the end of the thing, he says, at least I have chicken. <laughs>